Okay, thank you, Gina. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on the Opportunities Project Outcome Offers for Library Consortia and Associations through Group Accounts. Um, today's webinar is intended to introduce you to some of the features and functionalities of group accounts um, to collect and access data, and the ways groups can facilitate collaboration and partnerships among academic and research libraries. Before we get started, um, I do want to note that the content of this webinar is geared towards staff and leadership at consortia associations or any other types of groups that bring together multiple academic libraries. Um, if that's not you, that's okay. You're still very welcome to be here. Um, just be aware that probably to move forward with setting up a group account, um, you'd want to coordinate with leadership at your local association or consortia or leadership at the other libraries that you want to work with. Um, so my name is Sarah Gerk. I'm program manager at ACRL, where I'm responsible for project outcome for academic libraries. And joining me today is Emily Plowman, manager for impact and advocacy at the Public Library Association, where she's responsible for their version of the project outcome toolkit. So she'll be sharing some of her experience on working with public libraries in the field. So today we're going to start with a brief overview of project outcome. Um, I'm familiar. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it already, but just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Then we'll get into some details of group access, um, how it works, some of the logistics, what it would look like for you to set up a group account. Um, Emily will be sharing a couple examples uh, from public library groups, and we will be sure to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, I do want to be upfront also and say that there is a one-time fee to set up a group account. Uh, it's based on the number of institutions in the group. This is because it takes a fair amount of work uh, for staff and for web developers on our end to both set up and support those accounts. Um, I will get into details about the cost um, when we get to the point of discussing access, so we will get there. Um, first, I just want to make sure everyone understands uh, what Project Outcome does and what additional features group accounts enable. A quick question, how many of you are already familiar uh, with Project Outcome? If you could just click the raise hand icon on your screen there, just to give us a sense. Uh, okay, only seeing a couple, so maybe it is a, a good thing we're starting with some of that introductory content. Um, if you're not familiar, this will be a, just a very brief overview, um, and there are plenty of resources online, recordings from past webinars um, that we can point you to to help you learn more as well and have that information to share with your member libraries. Okay, so to start with a quick overview of what Project is, Project Outcome is and what it does, um, Project Outcome for Academic Libraries is an online toolkit for academic and research librarians and LIS students. It's designed to help academic libraries understand and share the impact of essential library services and programs. It's based on a set of simple surveys and an easy to use process for measuring and analyzing outcomes. We also provide libraries with resources and training support to help them apply their results and advocate for their library's future. Um, it's our version of the toolkit, Project Outcome for Academic Libraries, uh, launched in April of 2019. It's still uh, pretty new, but it's based on a model that was developed and tested by the Public Library Association, which has been in the field since 2015. So we really have learned a lot from their experience. Project Outcome for Academic Libraries, uh, as of just this week, had over 2,600 users at over 1,000 institutions in uh, 39 countries. It is open to all academic libraries uh, internationally. You can see from the map there just some of the institutions in the U.S. that have already collected data. Give you an, a sense of the extent um, of data that we're looking at at this point and that we're seeing that grow every day. Uh, the last screen there showed 29,000 survey responses, and um, that, that's now over 30,000. So it's really constantly um, being engaged with and growing. So what's in the toolkit? Um, for regular academic and research libraries, they have access to a set of quick and simple surveys, all based on outcome measurement questions. There's a survey management portal where they can set up and administer those surveys. Once they collect some data, they get ready-made and customizable data reports, also get a set of interactive data dashboards that help them explore and analyze the data they've collected. We provide a lot of resources and training materials that can help them engage further, and there's a peer discussion board uh, where users can ask questions or share examples of their work. 
And this combination of ready-to-go surveys and easy-to-use tools can really help library staff save time and energy on you know, planning data collection or writing surveys, leaving more time for decision-making and advocacy once they have those results. So as the name suggests, project outcome is based on outcome measurement. Um, so we're looking at those specific benefits that library programs or services offer to users. Um, we measure those in both quantitative and qualitative ways. So this is really trying to get at the question, you know, what good did we do? What good um, do we provide to our learners through these programs and services? So this is not the only type of assessment libraries do. Um, it's not a one-stop shop magic solution to all your problems, unfortunately, but it is an important piece of this assessment puzzle um, and a piece that often gets left out. So we really want to make it easier for libraries to engage in outcome measurement. Um, adding that data to the bigger impact story can help to drive that decision making and strategic planning. So for academic libraries, uh, the surveys, as I mentioned, this is all based on a survey toolkit. Um, there are seven key survey areas. Uh, they cut across different user types within academic and research libraries. So everything from you know, undergraduate instruction up through faculty research or public facing events or programs. Um, so they're not only focused on uh, students, they can be used for different user groups. Um, all of these surveys were developed and tested by other academic librarians. We had an ECRL task force that uh, developed and tested these uh, surveys and made improvements for the final versions that appear in the toolkit now. Each of the surveys as well comes in a couple different formats, um, immediate surveys and follow-up surveys. I'll come back to those in a little bit more detail. And so these are different than the topics that public libraries use. If any of you are familiar or work with public libraries, um, their topics are more geared towards the sorts of programs they tend to do. Uh, the academic library topics are more geared towards the sorts of services and programs uh, academic libraries do. Um, all of the surveys are based around measuring four key learning outcomes, knowledge, confidence, application or behavior change, and awareness. And all of them also contain two open-ended questions that ask what patrons like the most and what the library can do to improve. Uh, the language for each of the surveys varies um, depending on the particular topic. Um, and for all of the standard surveys as well, libraries can add up to three custom questions of their own. So as I mentioned, they come in two primary flavors, uh, immediate surveys and follow-up surveys, both uh, as the name suggests, immediate surveys designed to be administered immediately at the end of a particular program or service. Uh, they're based around four Likert scale quantitative questions and have those two standard open-ended questions as well. And follow-up surveys are slightly different format, uh, yes, no questions, also with those open-ended questions, um, and they're looking more at adoption. So immediate surveys ask, you know, what did you learn today? Follow-up surveys ask, did you use what you learned? Did you apply it um, in your work? And then we also have a whole lot of resources that help libraries do other types of data collection and to extend their work using outcome measurement. So just to give you an example of what this looks like, if you're not yet familiar with project outcome, um, this is the instruction immediate survey. You can see the words in bold there. Those show how those four questions align to those four key outcome measures. And then you have those two open-ended questions at the end. Um, and again, you can also add up to three custom questions of your own to any of these surveys. Um, I would encourage you to log in if you haven't done so in a while or haven't done so yet. Um, and you can preview all of these in the resources. So we've seen overall that there are a few um, key areas where this has been important for libraries to make changes, to make improvements uh, using the outcome data that they collect. A really big one is making program and service improvements, just having the feedback that can help them inform positive changes to the programs and services that they offer. Um, strategic planning can be another important area to be able to tie the sort of evaluation or assessment that they're doing to larger strategic goals at the library or institutional level, and then to measure progress towards those goals. Communication and advocacy is also really important. Libraries use project outcome data to be able to talk about their value, talk about their impact, again, either at the institutional level or more broadly. Um, funding requests, it helps to have evidence when making specific requests uh, for funding, often for particular initiatives or for particular things that the library needs, and project outcome can be useful in collecting some of that evidence. 
Um, and then partnership development. That's partly why we're here today. Um, this can be an opportunity for libraries to work with other units across their library, with other units on campus, and also with um, other academic libraries, other universities or colleges in their sort of initiatives that they do. So these are all areas where we've seen um, libraries doing great work using project outcome data. Okay, so that's a really quick introduction to what Project Outcome does. And now we're going to get a little bit more into what group access uh, enables you to do on top of all of that. So all the features that we've just talked about are available to regular academic and research libraries. It's all free. Um, so group access is another uh, layer of access, another layer of functionality that helps libraries uh, work collaborative, collaboratively towards those goals. Um, so again, academic and research library users have already free access to everything, but they will only see data from their particular institution. Um, if any of you on today's webinar are staff members at a consortium, but you don't work at a particular institution or library, um, you currently would have limited access. You'd be able to log in and see the resources and to get to the peer discussion board, but you wouldn't have access to the full toolkit. Um, group access allows data to be um, collected across multiple institutions to help for advocacy or measuring initiatives um, on the group level. And so that's what we're going to talk about in more detail. Um, so group accounts are a special type of account that allow you to create and administer surveys on behalf of any member institutions. Um, you can create survey templates that member institutions then use so that you create the survey for them and they um, can then administer it. Um, you can view data from your member institutions. This is really the only way that we'd allow data to be shared um, across institutions. Normally, you only, again, see, see data from your particular institution. Um, how much data a group user would see is going to depend on the type of account, which I will get to. Um, and then groups can also create reports based on that aggregate data from their uh, different member institutions. So we have two primary types of group access. Um, this is dependent on how much data your member institutions are willing to share or how much data you want to, to see. So the first type um, is full access where you would say for this group, we want all of these member institutions, we wanna see all of their data. They've given us permission to see all of their data. Um, and so the group user would be able to see all data from those member institutions um, if that's not okay with your member institutions, the other option is a template only access. So this would be where um, the group user creates survey templates that their member institutions can administer, but the only data they would see would be the data directly tied to those survey templates. So if um, member institutions are doing their own surveys in other areas, the group wouldn't see that data. Um, it is uh, dependent on you having permission. So you would need to talk to your member institutions um, and make sure they're okay with uh, this data being aggregated and shared at the group level. Um, but member institutions won't see each other's data um, without that group user access. So you'll set up a, an admin user or a few admin users for the group account and they're the ones through that login that will see all of this aggregate data. So for regular institutional users, um, what they see in terms of what data they have access to won't uh, change. So templates um, are available to both types of group users, um, both types of access, um, but for that template only level access, um, this would be the only functionality they uh, have. So templates are really good for if you're running a particular initiative across the group, like say all your member institutions are deciding to do um, a certain type of programming for open access week, or if you all are doing uh, very similar first year experience programs, you could set up um, a survey template that you want all your member institutions to use for that program. They then administer the surveys, report that data into the system, and you'd be, you'd be able to see the aggregate data across that initiative uh, for, the whole, um, for the whole group, for the whole consortia or association. Um, so this can be useful for grants. It can also just be useful for any sort of collaboration on particular initiatives. Um, if you're looking at um, broader activities, so if you have permission to access all of your member institutions data, um, then as well as being able to see any initiative data that you collect, you'd also be able to see all of that um, aggregate data. So this could help, you know, engagement with 
group member libraries or familiarity with going what's going on um, across a state or across a regional area um, overall. Okay, um, so cost, I promised we'd get into detail. Um, this is a one-time cost to set up a group account. Again, it's because it takes a fair amount of support uh, and work on our part. Um, it is based on the number of institutions in the particular group. And for any group that is set up, we would run a custom webinar tutorial for all group administrators, as well as members of that group. Um, we also give the group admin users access to special online tutorials that help them set up and manage their surveys. Um, so this works out to really less than $100 um, per institution in a group. Um, once you have an account set up, there's also no limit to the number of surveys or templates that you can create or the amount of data that you can um, collect or aggregate uh, as a group. Um, if you have more than 100 institutions in any special cases, we also can accommodate that, um, but we would just need to talk about that separately. Um, I'm going to come back to this again at the end, just if anyone decides you would like to move forward with setting up a group account, this is the information that we would need. We'd want to know the number of institutions, a list of those institutions, um, and then some details about uh, setting it up where we should send an invoice and who is going to be the group admin user or users for that particular account. I will put this slide up um, again at the end if anyone is interested. So at this point, I wanna get into a little bit more detail in terms of logistically what it would look like, how it would work for you to use a group account. Um, if you're familiar with Project Outcome already, uh, this home screen will look really familiar. This is um, what it also looks like for uh, group users as well as regular users. You will notice uh, the difference there being under survey management, you can see there's a template as opposed to just a regular survey. Um, so in the survey management tool, this is where it's a little bit different. Um, as well as just creating you know, regular surveys, you create templates that you can then publish to those member institutions. The process is really uh, similar to what it looks like for regular academic library users. Um, there's a creation wizard just like for creating a regular survey. Um, the difference is here where it asks you um, what destination libraries you want this uh, template to go to, who you want the data to be collected by. Um, you can also administer the survey even just as the group user. It doesn't have to be sent out by the member institutions. So you would select those um, in this first step. And the other difference is here when it comes to setting up uh, initiatives. So this functions uh, very similarly to what regular users see as program names. So for regular users, there's a program name that acts as a data filter. Um, the initiative name for group users acts the same way. This becomes a data filter. So if you are, in this case, um, the example I've created is the initiative name is Open Access Week. Um, I want all the member institutions in this consortia to administer this survey for any research programs they're doing during Open Access Week. Um, they would collect all that data and then that filter Open Access Week would be one way that I could sort the data uh, later on. So it's useful as a way of aggregating data across the institution. Um, the survey management tool also gives you options for customizing these surveys. So again, they're based around those uh, standard questions, but there are ways that you can uh, customize through that uh, template creation process, the initiative name as I just discussed. Um, institutions can add logos, you can add information about the initiative, about the program, um, you can add custom introductory and footer messages, um, add a redirect for the thank you page for any surveys that are being um, ad administered and having the data collected online, and again you can add um, additional questions as well. If a group user decides to set those additional questions, those will be published to the member institutions. If a group user doesn't set any additional questions, then the member institutions also have the option of adding their own even to the template. So what will this look like? Um, you set up a survey as a group user. Um, what your member institutions then see is going to be that template in their survey management tool. So they go in, they log in as their regular users and they can create a survey uh, from that template. When they then use that survey to collect data, again, that data will both show up in their institutional account and it will also show up in the group account. Like 
regular users as well. Um, groups have access to a whole host of data dashboards where they'll be able to explore and aggregate this data. Um, so this is the overview dashboard. Uh, it will show all data aggregated by survey topic and also by outcome across the different topics. Um, the difference here again from a regular user will be that you will be able to filter for different libraries or different institutions within the group. So looking at a little bit more detail, this is called the detail dashboard. It will show you the data by particular survey questions. Um, and you can see there at the top, these are the different filters that you'll have available to you uh, for your data. One of those filters is that initiative name. So again, if you're using that um, to administer surveys, that will become a data filter and give you a way to explore the data tied to that particular initiative. All of these data dashboards are live. They constantly uh, collect data as it's entered and uh, update, and all of them are interactive as well. So you can mouse over these results and get more detail as to what you're looking at. Um, one additional feature of Project Outcome I didn't mention previously is the benchmarking ability. Um, so regular academic libraries benchmark by Carnegie class and by uh, nationwide. And then for groups as well, you'd be able to see the, if you can filter by a particular institution, you'd be able to benchmark that institution against uh, the group as a whole. So that benchmarking feature can be really useful in terms of getting a sense of how a library is doing just overall. This, is, this dashboard is a little bit more complicated. This is the matrix dashboard. It's just intended to help give you an idea of the relationship between those survey topics and outcomes. Again, it's interactive, so you can mouse over the different aspects of this and get a better sense of what you're looking at, but it'll just show you where there's a more positive or more negative relationship between those survey topics and outcomes. All this data is also mapped as well. Um, so normally an institution would only see their particular dot show up in color on the map because that's the only data they have access to. For a group, you would see all the member libraries in that group show up in color and then all other participating libraries just show up as these black dots. You can get a sense of who else is using Project Outcome, who else is in the system, but it's not a competition. You're not seeing their uh, individualized results. The map also has this function of being able to explore some demographic data from the census alongside the survey outcome data. So if your group is based in a particular local area, this could be a way of exploring you know, how well you're serving that community, particularly for public facing programs. Once you have data collected as well, um, as well as those data dashboards that help you explore and visualize some of that data. You can also create reports that can then be shared with stakeholders or shared out to all the member institutions. So these give you a summary of both your quantitative and qualitative results, make it a little bit easier to share and discuss um, some of that work. And then um, there are a lot of resources that can help you in every area of this process. Uh, for groups in particular, the group users will see this instructional guide that can guide you through the process of setting up those survey templates and also creating the reports for groups, um, specific to groups. But there, you will also have access to all of the other resources in the toolkit. And again, these are all the resources that all your member libraries have access to as well. Okay, um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Emily to talk about how public libraries have already used this group functionality. We don't yet have any groups set up in Project Outcome for academic libraries. That's why we're having this webinar today. Um, but Emily's going to share some of that uh, information from public libraries. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah. Um, I'm just going to go through three examples of some different formats of groups that we have worked with on the public library side. Uh, the first comes from Buffalo Erie County Public Library out of New York and this group structure um, it would be similar to maybe a consortium that has a variety of similar library types within maybe one state um, or even a region within a state. Uh, and there's the Buffalo Erie, Buffalo and Erie County Public Library System serves as um, th there's one centralized and administrative entity that provides programming 
uh, support to all of its member libraries. So there's a, there's a number of libraries that they're working with within their consortium and they all have similar types of programming that are going on, but maybe not exact, uh, exact replicas of programming that's happening within each library. So I think in the academic side, I would, I would think about how um, there's some kind of student instruction maybe for first year uh, uh, students that are coming in that your consortium is all offering um, that have a lot of similarities across those different um, uh, schools, but maybe aren't exactly the same types of programs. So what Buffalo Erie County uh, wanted to do with their, with their group account was measure all of the uh, outcomes of their workforce and business development programs that were happening off-site, so outside of the library, within their consortium. And so they, they knew that they had a, kind of a smaller set of participants in classroom settings, working with different schools, colleges, and other partnering organizations, and they decided to administer the um, economic development and job skills surveys to patrons that were attending these classes. And this is an example where the, the uh, group has full access. So they're able to see all of the survey activity that's occurring within their system. Um, and there's not really a specific intervention that they're measuring beyond just what happens when we have these kinds of programs that libraries are offering um, under this header of workforce and business development. Uh, we want to look at all of the activity that's happening um, and they want to be able to sort out results by maybe a specific location or a specific library. So they will look at all of the data within this framework and then uh, break it down for different evaluation needs, but then also cluster it all together for a specific adult literacy grant initiative that they have. So their want for group access is really, um, it's really broad and flexible and they want to see a lot of the data and all of the data that's occurring, um, but then they want to be able to isolate it maybe geographically or within a specific um, library setup uh, to look at the data at a more specific level. So the next slide I'm going to show you um, comes from a state example that we have worked with and I'm, I've anonymized it for the um, for today's recording, but uh, what this state is doing is they have received a specific grant for um, a digital literacy program, and they want to require their um, grant recipients for this digital literacy program to report into the system the results of the programs they develop as a result of receiving those grant dollars. So in this example, the, the states on the public library side are also have full access group account um, structures, uh, but they can look at the, the data again in a variety of different ways. In this example, they're really just targeting the data around the one grant activity. So they can look at those libraries within the system and they can see specifically the ones that have received these grant dollars and then isolate out the data that's just tied to that digital literacy um, program. They could do a comparison where they're looking at um, the data where that intervention is occurring relative to the data for the rest of the digital literacy activity that's happening throughout the state. So they can do some comparison to see if that intervention uh, has, a, has a greater impact um, relative to libraries that haven't received those grant dollars. Um, but they can also then use this data to report back to the state in order to meet the reporting requirements um, for compliance tied to that grant. The other thing I want to note for all of these examples is that the libraries get to see their data as well. So there's a really good benefit to um, having the system structured the way it is because the, you know, the group account can see what they need to for the data, but the library also gets to view that data and make their own decisions at the local level if they want to improve programming or make some changes to what they're offering. So the last example I'm going to give uh, is from the National Networks of Library of 
libraries of medicine. And this is a really big group account that we're working with. This is uh, a good example if you are part of a consortium that's a big national network. Um, and this example has just the template only access. So what this means is that the national network of libraries of medicine only see the data that are collected one from their partner libraries and two where their partner libraries are reporting through the template structure so what this allows an nlm to do is see all of the data that they need to see as part of these different health um, an nlm health funded programming that programs that are happening in libraries across the united states uh, at the same time, again, the libraries get to see their data, um, but NNLM doesn't get to see all of the library's data. It just isolates out only the programs where data has, um, where, where data needs to be shared. So what's really nice about this group structure is that the libraries that might be measuring more than just health programming or doing health programming that's not NNLM funded um, will still be able to collect data within their accounts and see their own data, but they they know that that data is not being passed to NNLM. Uh, at the same time, at the national level, NNLM can do a lot of different visualizations and sorting based on a variety of different um, elements. So they could look at all of the data that's coming in for a particular program such as the stand up for health program that they might be funding nationwide or they can actually isolate data within a region so if you're familiar with the federal system there are regions throughout the united states and nnlm has headquarters within each of those regions and so they will want to look at the data that's just coming out of one particular region across all programs or for one particular program so they have the flexibility to do that um, and they can use this to measure the efficacy of the regional offices in terms of kind of program outreach and um, uh, the depth of training that's happening within a region, but they can also uh, look nationally at the results and see if they have one particular program in their suite of programs that's doing better than others, or if there's a, um, a universal response from patrons that identify a need for a change to a program um, that can help them, they could use that information to then improve the future iterations of, for example, Stand Up for Health. So I know that was a lot of information just to throw out there all at once. Um, certainly happy to answer any clarifying questions you might have from what I just covered. But with that, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Sara. Okay, thank you, Emily. So that was a lot of information. I know we probably have overwhelmed you a little bit. Um, please take this opportunity to type questions in the chat box. Um, please make sure that the to field says everyone so that everyone um, can see your question. Um, and then Gina is going to help us uh, sort through those and make sure we get them all answered. Um, while we're waiting for people to um, do that, I'm just going to put um, this slide from earlier uh, back up on the screen here with what we would need in terms of information from you um, at, at whatever point you're ready to move forward with the group account um, if you are interested in doing so. Hi Sara. So Hi. we uh, the first question we got is many of our member institutions have multiple libraries such as special collections, architecture, law, etc. Would project outcome allow us to view data at that level of granularity? For example, if we want to see how we were serving special collection libraries at different institutions. Okay, yes, great question. Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, so under each institution, an institution sets up locations. And so you can see data specific to those locations as well as data for the institution as a whole. Um, you might also do this you know, simply by survey topics. So we do have that digital and special collections survey, which we would love to see more special collections librarians using. Um, or you could do it by a template as well. You know, again, if there's a particular type of initiative or programming, you could set up a template maybe in the digital and special collections survey and ask your um, special collections members um, to be using that survey to help you aggregate the data that way. So you do have a few different options, but location is one of the things that institutions can set and that you can use as a data filter. Thank you. 
The next question is, can one college with multiple campuses still use the free account and be able to track and compare data at the multiple campus libraries, or would we need to get a group account to do that? Okay, um, the answer to this depends on how those campuses are set up. So we, our institutional registration and data structure is based on the Carnegie classifications data set. Um, that does seem to vary from state to state, especially in terms of uh, public institutions, whether they are grouped under um, one centralized um, listing or whether they're set up as separate institutions. Um, if they're set up as separate institutions, then you would need a group account to be able to aggregate that data. Um, if they're considered part of the same institution, then you wouldn't. You would have your, those campuses be uh, locations that are subsidiary to that institution. Um, if you have a specific question about your state or your um, college and campuses, um, definitely send us an email and we could uh, help more on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Um, and then we've got another question. How long does it take to set up a group account? Okay, uh, well, as we mentioned, we don't have one yet. So whoever is first uh, off, the, off the post um, will get to find out. But the process we are hoping to work with is that you would send us this email with the information about your group. Um, we would send you an invoice uh, right away and then get started on um, setting up that group in the back end of the system. Um, and we would also at that point work with you to schedule a webinar for you and for your members. Hopefully that webinar could be scheduled within um, four to six weeks. We can give you uh, group admin access um, as soon as we either have a check or if you are willing to um, sign the invoice and say that um, the account fee will be paid, then we can give you user access um, as soon as we have all those institutions added to the group. So hopefully um, it won't take very long. We'd imagine, again, we'd have that first webinar for you within uh, four to six weeks of receiving this information and let get you started right away. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, is project outcome only for recording, tracking data from surveys, or can it be used to track quantitative usage data statistics as well, i.e. circulation usage statistics? Okay. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all um, solution. It is only used for collecting um, and tracking data from these outcome-based surveys. It's not just a generic um, data collection tool. So we're focused on outcome measurement and focused on using um, these particular uh, surveys that are existing in the toolkit. Okay, and one more. Should we also encourage libraries to set up separate accounts or would they be set as project outcome members once the group joined? Okay, all um, institutions and libraries should already be in the system. So any of your member institutions, their librarians or library staff uh, can go and sign in for free themselves. And then once the group is set up, uh, they will also have that level of um, access or see the templates and be able to contribute activity um, in that way. So definitely please encourage your libraries to um, set up accounts and to start using Project Outcome. If, again, they should already be there, be listed in the system so they can join for free um, at any time. Um, please do, uh, if you have any further questions, please take this opportunity to ask them. We want to make sure that we get all your questions um, answered. Um, if we don't get a chance to answer them today, then definitely email us uh, at any point. Our primary email address is acrl at projectoutcome.org, and Gina and I can be sure to get back to you. Give it just another few seconds, see if we have any uh, last minute questions. And we might even uh, end a bit early. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so you will receive a link to the recording afterwards. We'll also make it available if anyone wants to um, check back or go through the content again on both the recording and the slides. 
Um, and it looks like there's another question about languages. Um, so the project outcome, uh, the platform has Google Translate integrated throughout the site. The surveys themselves, we have integrated translations so they can be administered in English, Spanish, or French. At this point, we're looking at um, options for adding other languages. Okay, not seeing any more questions at this time. Um, again, please do feel free to follow up with us with further questions about group accounts or anything else we can do um, to help. And um, thank you all for being here today. Sara, we have oh, one more yeah. late breaking question <laughs> about, um, maybe just came in, but about Canadian data. Sure. So again, Project Outcome is open to all users internationally. Um, for the benchmarking, any users outside the U.S. benchmark by uh, their nation state and internationally. So Canadian users would be benchmarking against uh, other Canadian users. Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you again for being here. Um, please do um, sign in and check out the resources available uh, in the toolkit. Um, there's a lot there where you can learn more about how it works and view past recordings of other webinars and tutorials as well.